Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Catelyn 7, A Game of Thrones. The Roman numerals are starting to get tricksy now. They're doing all the business with the with the VI. I is 8, but IX is, is 9, and then XI is 11, and you'd think the Romans... Yeah, I mean, I mean, if the Romans could work out aqueducts, and the Romans could work out those, those, those nice long roads, and the Romans could work out the Colosseum, you'd think they could work out a better numeral system than they did. They should have learned from the, from the Arabs with their with their curly Arabic ones. Those are some. Those, that's some good numbers there. That's that's ten out of ten. All right. So the chapter is a Catlin chapter. And what's going on here is that we are about to witness the fight, the the holy, religiously sanctified uh, combat between Vardis Egan and Bronn in order to 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 divine the fate of Tyrion Lannister. We are we 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 are trying to find out whether or not Tyrion Lannister was responsible for the murder of John Arryn, as Lysa Arryn alleges, when in fact Lysa Arryn was the one who murdered John Arryn. Uh, and of course, the gods think that combat is a reasonable enough way to see whether someone is innocent or not, which which is entertaining, you know, it's good for fiction. Um, I mean, imagine if the trial of O.J. Simpson went down to, to a fight, just a bare knuckle that that would have been uh, can you imagine the ratings the tv ratings that would have got if the trial of oj simpson was a bare knuckle fight that would be um i mean americans already have that the i mean they've privatized the prison system haven't they so that's for profit why don't they privatize the court system make some entertaining combat Instead of the boring, dry, old legal paperwork nonsense that goes on now, wouldn't that be exciting? Everyone would get invested in the legal process if it was... A... So anyway, so Catelyn is thinking about uh, the sunrise. Uh, the sunrise is very pretty. It's gold and rose as it breaks over the Vale of Arryn. And the light is spreading and dawn is creeping and there are mists and there's tumbling waterfalls coming down the Giant's Lance. So the Giant's Lance is this great big mountain. Big ass mountain that the Eyrie is on top of. And Alyssa's Tears is the name of the waterfall that drops down from the top of the mountain all the way down like Splash Mountain at Disneyland. Uh, except this this waterfall is so high up at the top of the mountain that most of it turns into mist and spray before it even reaches the ground, which sounds a bit fanciful, honestly. I don't know if if such a waterfall exists in the real world. Someone Google it, but I don't think I don't I don't I don't know about that. Because what would the source of the waterfall be that high up? And and surely. I don't know. But it's called Alyssa's Tears. And supposedly, Alyssa's Tears is named after a woman called Alyssa Arryn, whose family was murdered before her, but Alyssa did not cry. So after Alyssa died, the gods punished Alyssa by making her be a waterfall that was crying continuously. Which, again, is another odd story. I mean, it's kind of reminiscent of those sort of Greek weird punishment sort of things we were talking about. But, like, in this case, the, the woman's crime was was not crying sufficiently. Which which is a bit of a head-scratcher, that one. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that even a crime, really? Is that... I mean, that's like the, that's like the jaywalking of, of ancient Greek. Anyway, so Catelyn is... Um, is watching the sunrise, and she reflects on Alyssa Arryn, and she, um, Alyssa Arryn, by the way, was supposedly, she, supposedly she lived 6,000 years ago, and I'm going to be real, in a society that, like, is, like, literate, but just barely, in a society that, like, hasn't got a printing press, I really doubt whether they've got the capability to accurately record things that happened 6,000 years ago, which of course is one of the themes explored in the series. There's all this history that's contested and disputed, and there's all this stuff, of course, with like, you know, Azor Ahai and the, and the Long Night and all of that stuff that, that, 
that is very mysterious and unknown because because the records don't really exist, even though the maesters seem to think they know what's what. Figures like figures like this Alyssa Aaron chick, I mean, who the hell knows when she lived or if she even lived at all? It's a mystery. History is exciting. Uh, next page. So, uh, Roderick, meanwhile, is uh, informing Catelyn of some shit that's been going on. Uh, Roderick Cassell tells Catelyn that the Kingslayer, Jamie Lannister, is making an army, bringing an army together at Casterly Rock. Of course, Jamie and Tywin are mad that Tyrion has been abducted and that and Jamie's just had this fight with Ned in King's Landing, so the Lannisters are gathering an army. Uh, and so in re- so so in response, Edmure Tully from River Run uh, has ridden up to Casterly Rock uh, and gone, uh, mm, knock, knock, Mr. Tywin, sir, uh, mm, what... What are you planning to do with with that giant army that you're building up next door? To you know, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't use that on us, would you? You what? You you wouldn't? Uh, huh? And Tywin uh, gives no answer. Tywin gives no answer, which is ominous. Uh, when your neighbor when your neighbor gets his gets his boys around uh, for a for a for a spat. Uh, yeah, so Edmure was worried, so he gets his own boys together, and this is what we call an arms race for those who are paying attention. Tywin's gathering his boys, so Edmure gathers gathers his boys. He commands Lord Vance and Lord Piper to guard the pass near the Golden Tooth, and everyone start getting oh, military. It's like North Korea when the North Koreans are like, oh look, we got so many missiles, and the South Koreans and the Americans are like, look, we've got so many missiles, and then what you end up with. It's just a whole fucking lot of missiles when no one wants to be missiled. In the in the history of humanity, there's never been anyone who wanted a missile with the pointy end pointed at them, and yet we've spent so much time making missiles. That 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 doesn't make sense, does it? But they keep making missiles. Uh, and then Catelyn is like, oh, wow, look at the contrast between how beautiful the sunrise is and how shitty and gross this, 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 this conflict and war in the real life is. Contrast. Literature. Hashtag. Um, and Roderick's like, but we, but I, I'm, I, we haven't heard any news about Hoster Tully. Because, of course, Hoster Tully, the father of Catelyn and the father of Edmure and the lord of, of, the, of the Riverlands, is the one who should be met, t- like calling the shots here. Because Edmure has a bit of a reputation of, as being somewhat incompetent. Uh, and so Catelyn's kind of like, shouldn't Lord Hoster be running shit? Uh, and, 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 and she figures that, well, since Edmure is doing stuff, it must be that Hoster is like really sick or something, so that makes her worry that her dad is unwell, and of course he is unwell and dies in not too long. Hashtag spoilers. Um, and so Catelyn's worried about that stuff, the political conflict, war shit that's happening in the Riverlands and the Westerlands. Uh, and Catelyn then thinks about, all right, so also what's happening right here, right now? Tyrion Lannister is is gonna be fought over by Vardis Egan and Bronn. What the fuck's up with that? That's a terrible idea. The dwarf has fucking played us here. This is this is not this is not good for us. Uh, Catelyn is like, w- w- I should fucking get out of here, man. I need to go back to Winterfell with my sons. Like, why am I caught up in this bullshit? Hey, Catelyn, maybe you shouldn't have abducted Tyrion in the first place when you had no evidence of any wrongdoing. But, too late, she's made her bed, she's made her dwarf, and now she must lay in it. D- don't, don't lay in the dwarf. Uh, and so they talk about leaving, but it's all like, eh, we need to see this through. And they talk about Lysa, and they talk about how Lysa, Lysa's policies vary with her moods, and her moods change hourly, uh, which reminds me of a certain, a certain Twitter feed. Um, but the, the, but the shy girl who Lysa had known at River Run has turned into a woman who is proud, fearful, cruel, dreamy, reckless, timid, stubborn, vain, and inconsistent above all. So Lysa's basically all over the fucking joint. She can't decide what she wants. She's like, I want, I want, I want bologna, I want peanut M&Ms, I want, a, I want a, I want a pony. I, I go from pony to bologna. She's all over the, she's, she's all over the shop is Lysa Aaron. Uh, and that's a problem when you're a leader. A leader needs to be firm and consistent 
and 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 clear about about their intentions and about their policies. They can't they can't go going back on promises. They can't they can't say one thing then do another. They can't have their uh, that's topical. Um, and then they mention the vile turnkey Maud, and they mention um, and then they mention how Catelyn's like you know Tyrion was my prisoner. What, I don't want all this bullshit happening. Lys has taken Tyrion from me. This isn't how it was going to happen. Uh, and then Brynden Tully, Catelyn's uncle, walks in and describes the show outside. There's a sort of a crowd gathering around the jewel as a fools' festival, and Brynden does not have a lot of patience for fools' festivals. Uh, and Brynden is like, man, I want to get the fuck out of here. I need to get back to River Run because I mean. Because uh, uh, Brynden is, of course, from the Riverlands, and his family, the Tullys, live in River Run. He, and since Tywin's getting antsy with all these missiles direct, he, all, all all of his intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at River Run. Brynden's like, I need to get home and protect the fucking pad, mate, from these rampaging lions. But apparently, Lysa was like, No, Brynden, you can't, you can't go. You can't take any men with you. You can't do any of that shit. You belong here, guarding my gate, as Brendan has been doing for these last years. But Brendan's like, fuck that, man. I got, I got fucking, I got to look after my pad, my joint. Um, and Cat and Lysa's like, no. So Lysa's really paranoid, and she wants to keep all of her swords in the veil, which at the one point is like, you know, overprotective. But at the other hand, Lysa knows better than anyone, uh, well, better than some, that war is coming and you want to be prepared uh so Catelyn's like uh yeah well Brynden I mean all right I mean you could just go on your own but then you die along the high road that's populated by the mountains the mountain clansmen blokes who attacked Catelyn before so Catelyn's like how about you come with us we can take a ship up up to the north and then you can go to the to the riverlands from there it'll be great let's have a party and then Brynden's like yes and then you get a little dialogue message Brynden Tully has joined your party uh and then and then they they go but uh, Lysa, Catelyn, Catelyn leaves her room and she looks out at the broader surrounds and there's, uh, there, there's a little garden which was originally intended to be a god's wood. Uh, lots of castles in Westeros have a god's wood, which is a sacred forest for the old gods, which has a weirwood tree in it, a heart tree. Uh, which is interesting because the people of the Vale don't follow the old gods for the most part. Uh, this castle was raised by Andals, I, I think. Uh, which, 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 are, who are people who follow the faith of the seven? So it's interesting that they that they include a godswood in their design. Um, th- there are there are godswoods in lots of castles that aren't built by Northmen. So it's interesting that there's that that tolerance or interest in the, that that old god first men custom. It might just be a tradition more than anything else, you know. But interesting. Uh, and, but yeah, they couldn't plant a weirwood in this particular place in the Eyrie because the soil was too stony and mountainous and wouldn't take root for the weirwood. So now it's just a little garden with some statues and shit. Nothing as impressive as a god's wood. Uh, and then Lysa is outside. And so Lysa is scrubbed and garbed, uh, and she's surrounded by her suitors. Uh, ever since John Arryn died, uh, Lysa has been surrounded by all these men who want to marry her, uh, not for her devilish good looks and charming wit, but for her uh, position as 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 Lady of the Vale, uh, because if you marry her, you get to be Lord of the Vale and become one of the most popular men in Westeros. So naturally, she is a popular uh, bachelorette right now. Um, and Robert Aaron, uh, Lysa's son, the Lord of the Vale, is there. Uh, he's giggling and clapping as a puppeteer plays a show with some puppets hacking at each other. And Robert uh, seems quite amused and impressed by this show of puppetry, because I suppose, you know, they haven't got, you know, Candy Crush or whatever the fuck kids do for entertainment these days. They haven't got any fidget spinners in Westeros, so uh, so Robert has to uh, be entertained by uh, puppetry. Uh, and, uh, and we get a food description, there's blackberries and orange-scented wine, and Lysa's really making a bit of a show out of this trial of Tyrion Lannister. She's really having fun with this. A fool's festival, as Brendan described it. Um, and Lysa is being surrounded by all these men who are trying to woo her, uh, so Lord, Lord Hunter is telling her jokes, and, and so Lynn Corbray feeds Lysa a blackberry from the point of Lynn's dagger, which, which, <laughs> there's this book called, uh, Tessa the D'Urbervilles, some old-timey 
old old period sort of thing or something and and there's this great scene where like the sort of bad seductor man in black like his name is like like freddy devil boots or like he's i'm I, I, the bad guy but like the sexy bad guy is like trying to woo the protagonist tess and so they have this scene in like this garden where where the where the, where the bad seductive sexy man is feeding tess a strawberry like feeding it right into her mouth and of course the strawberry is chosen as like one of the more phallic of fruits in the way it's described of like the red and like the fruit into her mouth is is played in a very like the devil is giving her like this apple of like sexual like that's sort of the vibe that's going on there and I and I feel like there's a certain similar vibe perhaps going on here with the bad man, Lynn Corbray, feeding the innocent Lysa fruit. Except in this case, of course, uh, Lysa <laughs> Lynn Corbray uh, is gay uh, and probably not terribly interested in Lysa for her body, uh, as, as, as Tess was. And also, Lysa is hardly the, the innocent, victimless maiden that Tess was, given that Lysa literally just murdered her husband. So... Uh, a different situation than that book, I suppose. Uh, and so there's all these fucking suitors hanging out, and there's and there's Eon Hunter, who's this gouty old man with quarrelsome sons. Um, and Lin is described as this, yeah, this this dangerous, angry, uh, and and apparently gay guy, possibly pedophile guy. It's all a bit ambiguous. Uh, and then Lysa sees Catelyn and embraces her and gives her a moist kiss. Because, of course, when you use the word moist, it's the easiest way to make a character seem gross. Uh, so they chat. And Catelyn's like, yo, Lysa, you know this whole thing that you're doing is like a terrible fucking idea, right? Like, you know that we have nothing to gain and everything to lose by having this fight for Tyrion Lannister, right? You know this is this is dumb with a capital um, right? You know, this is... Zero, zero out of ten idea, uh, Lysa. Bad idea. And then, uh, Lysa, and then, and then all these suitors who are standing around Lysa are like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, little lady. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, so this guy, uh, this guy, Morton Waywood says, oh, women, women understand little of these things. It's their uteruses wandering around inside their body and getting confused with the with the brain when the juices are in misalignment. All the four humors are out of whack, and so the women have no, no inclination for strategic military thinking. Because you see, Servatus Egan is a knight, a trained, honorable, chivalrous knight, and Bronn is this ugly fucking, you know, you, he's a coward, he's a sellsword, he's, 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 he's a lesser human, and so he couldn't possibly beat a, a, a knight, an anointed, trained knight. You are a woman, only a small girl, and know little of the ways of war, so I wouldn't expect you to understand this fighting thing. And Catelyn's like, and Catelyn responds with a courtesy that makes her mouth ache by saying that, but you're, but you're, you're a fucking idiot though, because still fundamentally this whole fight doesn't make any sense for us because if we win, Tyrion dies, which means we A, lose a hostage, B, piss off the Lannisters and C, never find out if Ty Tyrion even killed Jon. And if Tyrion wins, then Tyrion leaves and we lose everything and still piss off the Lannisters and still don't find out if Tyrion did anything wrong. So this whole thing of doing the, doing this trial is a fucking terrible idea. We should just hunker down. We should just sort of, like, don't... This is the opposite of what we should be doing. But the suitors aren't listening, and Lysa isn't listening because they're all uh, proud fools, basically. Well, Lysa is a murderer who's trying to cover up her own murder as well. Um, and so they all just say a bunch of shit, and then Lysa settles it by saying, look, look, we have a very good reason for having this fight and for killing Tyrion Lannister. It's because my son, Lord Robert, said that he wanted to see Tyrion fly out the moon door. He wanted to see Tyrion die. A, a, a six-year-old child wanted to see Tyrion die, and that's the reason why we're killing him. Conversation over. And then Catelyn goes, wow, we're fucked. <laughs> uh, and, um, 
And Lysa, yeah, talks more about, oh, Tyrion killed Jon, when in actual case Lysa killed Jon. And then Roderick, quietly to the side, is like, Callum, is that even true? Did Tyrion kill Jon? And and Callum's like, well, maybe not. Maybe it was Jon or Cersei, uh, Jamie or Cersei. I believe that some, one of the Lannisters killed Jon. Uh, which, which again, is kind of like, I mean, I guess that there's this whole artifact of once once you've invested uh, time and effort into believing a certain thing, uh, it's very hard to change your mind afterwards, right? So like once you've once you've um, once you've spent five hundred dollars on on a on a do your own homeopathy kit, it's 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 difficult to have your mind changed by. Anyway, so the point is that. Um, the point is that everything that's happening is terrible. And that they have no idea wh- whether Tyrion is actually guilty of anything. Um, and then the two puppet knights, uh, th- they're doing the fight, and then one of the little puppet knights gets broken, and there's this fake blood effect, and Robert's like, wah great, death. So that, of course, is like sort of an analogy for what's about to happen with the real fight. So the little puppet knights, the fake knights, have just simulated a, 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 a death in the combat, and so Robert is delighted at the death. Robert's scary, that little, little powerful, um, uh, um, um, like, uh, empathyless boy. He hasn't been taught to care about the feelings of other people. He wants to execute someone for fun. Robert is a worry. Um, and then Maester Coleman comes along, and he's been having a, a, a bit too much of the old drinker rink, apparently, because he spills some beans. Some high-value beans are spilled by Coleman. He reveals that before John was killed, uh, John Aaron was planning to foster young Robert Aaron, his son, to Dragonstone with Stannis Baratheon. Uh, and there's a bit of confusion about, but Callan's like, oh no, I thought they were actually going to Castle Rock. And then they're interrupted before they can finish it. And there's actually a small secret sort of revealed here, that there seems to be a bit of different people believe different things about where uh, little Robert Aaron was going to be fostered. Uh, and the point of this, seemingly, there are different opinions, but the point of this is possibly is that part of the reason why Littlefinger was able to convince Lysa to murder John Aaron was because John Aaron was planning to foster Robert to Stannis at Dragonstone. And of course, Lysa, being a very overprotective mother, did not want to let go of Robert. And of course, with Littlefinger whispering into her ear like grim a worm tongue, Littlefinger could easily have convinced Lysa that this was part of a plan to separate Lysa from Robert permanently, or that Robert might be in some kind of danger, or that, you know, John might not care about his son, or some kind of whispery, secretive, slimy words were poured into Lysa's ear, like like the poison into Hamlet's father's ear, and and that caused Lysa to, to agree to murder John Aaron, so that she could keep her beloved Robert son with her. That might have been part of it, but it's unknown, unconfirmed, and Lysa dies with that particular secret. Um, and then Tyrion Lannister is brought out, uh, and uh, they go to, f- and uh, they, and Robert says, oh, I want to make the little man fly, but then uh, Lynn Corbray draws trial first, then execution. Uh, and you know that when, when Lynn Corbray is the one reminding everyone of due process in justice and law, uh, that's a bit of a fucking worry. Uh, that's like, that's like, um, that's like a lot of things. Um, so Vardis Egan comes out, and so the fight is going to happen soon. So Vardis Egan comes out, and he's armoured. He's got lots of heavy armour all over him, including uh, a helmet that looks like the beak of a falcon. Um, and, and he's got enamelled cream and blue armour and lobs... Actually, it's almost... I think George Martin has has snuck another food description into this chapter, actually, because the the armour is is cream and blue, and the and the... Uh, the skirt is lobstered metal, uh, and and the helmet has falcon's wings on it. And I'm sure falcon's wings would taste good if you prepared them right. So I think there's actually a recipe hidden inside here. And if you cooked that recipe, that would unlock the secrets of the winds of winter. Probably. It's an Easter egg in there that George Martin has hidden. And then Bronn comes out, and then he, in contrast to Vardis Egan, is very lightly armoured. He's not wearing all this heavy plate. And spoiler, uh, that is an advantage for him, because it makes him lighter and quicker. Bronn is taller and younger, and has a longer reach than Vardis Egan. 
And then there's there's this sort of ceremony before the duel where the plump septon comes out and does says the words and does the things and waves the crystal to say that this this fight to the death between men for no good reason is actually a wholly religious concept. It's actually, I mean, the faith of the seven sort of seems like a more sort of civilized and softer and more 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 reasonable religion than the old gods because the old gods have these undertones of like sacrifice and hardness and brutality. But the Faith of the Seven too, I mean, it, it, it has like like combat to the death as part of its like legal system. And even if it dresses it up as like this nice pretty crystal rainbow happiness sunshine and thing thing, it's still kind of gross and bad and bloodthirsty, honestly. But anyway, so that happens and then basically the fight begins. Uh, and, uh, and, and Vardas, well, not yet, because we need some more description. So Vardas Egan has a sword, a, a pretty, pretty engraved special special sword, which was originally the sword of John Arryn. Lysa Arryn made it for John Arryn, or had it made at King's Landing. Uh, which is kind of interesting, because we don't know much about the relationship between Lysa and John. Uh, it seems to have been quite loveless, um, and not all that pleasant, given that, of course, Lysa ended up murdering John, but, but Lysa was, you know, giving these nice presents of a fancy longsword to her husband, it, it, so it's interesting to speculate just what their relationship was like. Maybe it was good for a time before it soured, we don't really know. Uh, and Bronn, meanwhile, has a, has an ugly, ugly simple sword, but it's sharp. It's sharp as a razor. Well, it's sh- it is a razor. What's the definition of a razor? Well, it's quite sharp. Um, and he also has a coarse black beard. Keep your razor sharp and your black beard coarse. That's what I say. Uh, and so they're ready uh, to fight. Um, and, and, and they keep making these comments about how Vardas Egan looks a bit uncomfortable using John Aaron's sword instead of his own sword, and Vardas Egan seems a bit weighed down by his armour. George Martin always gives you hints of, of, of the, of the twist conclusion to come, and in this case we're getting lots of hints that Vardas Egan might be at a disadvantage against Bronn. Um, and then Robert Aaron says, go, 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 uh, and they begin to fight. So Vardis Egan goes on the attack, and he's swinging and swaying and fling, fling, flinging, uh, and then Br- Bronn keeps, like, leaping back and dancing away. There's always a lot of dancing in, um, George Martin's combat descriptions. Um, and while this fight happens, Catelyn reminisces on a fight, another fight that happened at River Run many years ago, the fight between Brandon Stark and Peter Baelish, Littlefinger. Uh, so, of course, for those, you probably all know the story, but, but w- w- way back when, Catelyn Stark was betrothed, was going to marry Brandon Stark. Brandon Stark, the brother of Eddard and Benjen and Lyanna. Um, and, uh, problem was, Littlefinger, young Littlefinger, who had been fostered at River Run, uh, was in love with Catelyn, and Lysa was in love with him, so there was an awkward love triangle there. Uh, and so, uh, Peter challenged Brandon Stark for the hand of Catelyn, uh, which was this very romantic, brave thing that young Littlefinger did in his naivety, believing that, you know, being a righteous young hero, he would overcome this nasty, big Northman man. Uh, but he learned, sadly, uh, the truth that in this world, uh, the big men usually stomp the little men, unless the little men, like Bronn, have some other kind of advantage, like wits, or a razor-sharp sword, or a coarse black beard. You've got to have something, or else, because valor is not enough. Righteousness is not enough. Faith is not enough. You need something real and pragmatic of utility to succeed in the Game of Thrones. Um, so yeah, spoiler, Littlefinger lost that duel. Uh, but Catelyn didn't end up marrying Brandon, of course. Brandon ended up killed by the Mad King, and Catelyn ended up marrying Ned Stark, so go figure. Um, and so, uh... And of course that, and of course that was a very formative experience for Littlefinger. Like Littlefinger, after that fight, he realized that he wasn't going to win. He wasn't going to get what he wanted by playing the game of nobility and chivalry and swinging swords real good. He turned into a twisted little plankton man who prefers manipulating things and knowing things and being a slimy Machiavellian bastard who, who, to his credit, succeeds in empowering himself. He just also succeeds in being a evil, creepy wanker. So there's that. 
Uh, and then back in the present, the fight continues between Vardis Egan and Bronn. Um, oh, one other anendum, uh, addendum, anendum, addendum. Uh, after uh, after Littlefinger lost the fight with Bran and Stark, uh, Littlefinger was nursed back to health uh, with the help of Lysa Tully. So Lysa. Uh, uh, sort of tended to Littlefinger, and of course, you know, we've all seen, we've all seen the pornos, uh, nurses, they, they just love patients, just in, injured men, there's something about blood that just gets, gets the nurses going, you know, you've all, you've, it, it's, it's, it happens. Uh, so Lysa has sex with Littlefinger. Do you think, do you think Littlefinger was still wounded while that, while that happened? I, that would, that would, that could really hurt. You'd have to sort of be a bit gingerly in your movements, I would think, so as not to open any wounds, physical, emotional, or otherwise. But the point is that that Littlefinger and Lysa had sex uh, that night. For the second time, actually, though Littlefinger thought that was the first time, because Littlefinger thought uh, he had, he, the first time he had sex with Lysa was actually with Catelyn. It's complicated. You probably know this shit anyway. But the point is, Littlefinger got Lysa pregnant, that night. And then Lysa was like, finally, the, the little twerp boy I love uh, has gone me pregnant, which means he has to marry me now, right? Right? That's how it works. And then John Aaron came in and said, wrong. That's not how that works. I'm not letting you marry Littlefinger because he's too low birth, too low station. It's not politically advantageous for you to marry him. Uh, and therefore, you can't keep that baby. I'm not letting some little low-born bastard run around the river on stinking up the place. You're going to have to abort that baby, which Lysa desperately didn't want to do. And so we have this tragic uh, abortion of Lysa that not only was, was against Lysa's will, but which apparently damaged her body permanently because uh, she got very sick and she also uh, henceforth had a lot of trouble giving birth. She had like stillborn kids and stuff, as many women in Westeros do. Uh, so, that, so that's a really important chapter in the lives of Littlefinger and Lysa. Um, Catelyn may be less, less impacted by the whole thing. Catelyn was the lucky one of the Tully sisters. So you've got to have some sympathy for Lysa, even though she's a murderer and a terrible ruler and kind of an awful person. <coughs> so they fight. <laughs> they fight. Vardas Egan and Bronn fights. There's blows, there's scrambling, there's coming hard. Oh, oh my, that's... Uh... <laughs> That sounds like um, Littlefinger and Lysa again. Um, so there's all that happening, and then uh, they're, they're fighting around the statue. There's a statue of Alyssa Arryn, the, the ancient Alyssa Arryn, the weeping woman. There's a statue of her in the garden, and Vardis and Bronn are fighting around the statue. Um, and uh, and Bronn's sort of being a pussy and sort of getting back and, like, dodging all the blows because he's trying to tie her out, Vardis Egan. Um Meanwhile, all the lords of, of the Vale are just standing around watching this fight, making wry jests and refilling their wine cups. These motherfuckers are fighting for their lives down here, and these fuckers are just sitting there like fucking Roman, Roman emperors watching the fucking peons fight for their amusement. Like the, like the motherfuckers in Wally, like those fat motherfuckers who sit there playing Wii Tennis all day on the spaceship because the deaths... Of of men are are nothing but entertainment once you reach a certain social class. Um, maybe not like the the people in Wally. Anyway, so that's that's happening, and then there's more dancing and there's more fighting. Uh, and and then there's a crunch because Bronn successfully delivers a blow on Vardis Egan that hurts him quite badly. Um, and it's a steel song. G George Martin loves describing fights as songs, and uh, he actually wrote a he actually wrote a book about like a rock and roll ghost story thing. George Martin's quite into 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 music and writing music lyrics, though I don't I don't know if he plays any instruments or anything. It, writers all want to be rock and roll stars. Everyone wants to be rock and roll stars. Anyway, so they're fighting, um, and then Roderick offers some insightful commentary to Catelyn. Roderick says, Vardis is hurt, and Catelyn's like, I can very well fucking see that with my peepholes, mate, because Vardis is swimming in his own gizzards at this point. He, well, he's not quite swimming in gizzards, but he's 
he's bloody and red and he's injured. Um, and they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting. Uh, and, um, and then Lysa, who <laughs> is an idiot, I guess, is like, Valus, you, you can finish him off now. I think it's time to end this fight. You better kill Bronn while Valus is fucking r- losing lifeblood to Bronn because Bronn's w- beating him. Uh, and then Valus makes a last desperate blow and swings his arms to chop Bronn's fucking head off. Bronn dodges uh, and manages to push the statue of the weeping woman, uh, Alyssa Aaron. The statue crashes onto Vardis Egan, crunches him, which they don't show in the show. In the show, they have the fight like in the throne room around the moon door, um, which was cool in some respects, but yeah, different in the books. And so the statue crunches down on top of Vardis Egan, and Vardis goes and finishes. Bronn finishes Vardis by slitting his falcony little throat. And then everyone's like, shit, that wasn't meant to happen. That wasn't the plan. That that was not the plan. And bloody, um, what was his name? That Waynewood wanker. Who was he? Morton Waynewood. I hope he's embarrassed now. All his talk of how Bronn would go to water in front of Vardis. Fucking Waynewoods. They're all a bunch. Anyway. Um, and so Bronn wins. Uh, and, uh, and, and Catelyn, and, 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 and Robert Aaron is like, is it over? And then Catelyn thinks, no, now it's only beginning, which is reminiscent of, of, of Ned's line at the Tower of Joy. No, now it ends. And the story of Robert's Rebellion has ended. The story of Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire, is now just beginning. Because now that Tyrion's free and loose to fucking hang out, uh, the Lannisters are gonna want revenge on 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 everyone for the injustice, or at least Tywin is. Um, and then Tyrion stands up and he's like, "Well, this was fun, but I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna scoot. I think I'm gonna skedaddle. I think I'm gonna get out of the Vale. Your hospitality has been great. Your sky cells a bit cold. Your jailers a bit." Beaty, I'll I'll give it a two out of ten on Foursquare, but on Yelp. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna leave if it's all the same to you. I'm out. Uh, and then Lys is like shit. Uh, and uh, Robert Aaron meanwhile is like, you mean I don't get to see the dwarf die now? And he starts trembling and having a fit because that's something that Robert does. And Lysa is furious and she's like, oh well, the gods have decided to free Tyrion because of course, remember, of course, this is all meant to be a methodology for establishing. Uh, who the gods think is righteous and whether Tyrion is guilty. You'd think the gods, being omnipotent, could could communicate whether Tyrion is 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 guilty or not without having to kill a combatant in a trial. The, but I guess the gods like the spectacle as well. Um, and so anyway, so Lysa's like, all right, fine, you can leave, but here's the thing. I'm not going to provide you with any guards. It's just you and Bronn, and you're leaving on your own. And the only way out of the Vale is along the high road, through the Mountains of the Moon. And the Mountains of the Moon are full of the clansmen who attacked you on the way there, the ones who almost killed you all. And you are just two men. So basically, when I send you on the high road, you're fucked. And then Tyrion says, Oh, well, hmm, uh, you can let us out now. Uh, I believe we know the way. And that's how the chapter ends. And that is probably one of Tyrion's less convincing comebacks, because as as clever as he is, he doesn't see many ways out of passing the high road on his own with Bronn right now. Though, where there's a Tyrion, where there's a dwarf, there's a way. Where there's a dwarf, there's a way. And as we soon see, Tyrion does indeed find a way to talk his way through the high road by enlisting the Mountains of the Moon onto his side, which is a move I don't think anyone expected. Although the deaths of Vardis, death of Vardis Egan at the hands of Bronn, we probably did all expect because George Marden d- d- dolloped that foreshadowing like a bunch of cream into a lobster soup uh, under a under a under a falcon wing buffet. T- time to have a snack, I think. Thank you for listening. To this episode of Alt Swift X's Game of Thrones Abridged. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you will enjoy the day and the days that are to come. Cheers.